Hi, and welcome to the Keys to Therapy. Today's episode, we have Victoria Brewer. Hi, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah. So if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, that's great. So like I said, my name is Victoria Brewer. I am a licensed clinical mental health therapist who practices up in the Huntersville area. I have been practicing for almost four years. I went to UNC Charlotte for grad school, which is what brought me to the Charlotte area. And then I've expanded since then. Um, I have mainly worked in private practice, but I also did my internship and some PRN work um, for the Hopeway Foundation, which is a nonprofit facility that does residential, partial, and intensive outpatient programming. So experience kind of around the board here. Yay. And we're going to totally dive into all of that, (laughs) which will be great. Um, So to get like way back, uh, what made you decide that you wanted to be a therapist? How did this come about? So I've known since I was 10 years old. That's okay. been something that I have been so sure of for so long in my life. When I was 10, I was in a car accident and I had to do court mandated therapy. And my mom didn't tell me until I was in the waiting room and literally freaked out. Oh, I was like, I'm not crazy. I like I I remember it so clearly being so upset with her for oh. upset for um taking me there. And then after our assessment, I was like, I have to be him. This is a literal magician who worked <laughs> through my mind and somehow through talking made me feel better. It's like, oh. what? that is such a dream job to have. So I continued going to see him for quite some time. And ever since that moment, I knew this is what I wanted to be. I've always liked helping people. And so being in a therapeutic role just fit. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because I feel like a lot of people are drawn to this field, whether it's something like personally or something within their family, there's like some sort of tie. And even if it's not something that has happened, it's kind of just like your personality. (laughs) That's sort of right. That's what I learned in grad school was that the people I was in school with, Mm -hmm. and also the therapists that I meet today, we all have just something there that connects us. Mm -hmm. Um, It's something in our personality that I think you know, no matter how we got here, we got here for a reason. Oh yeah. And I think that that helps us as we're helping others. So I've definitely noticed a difference between like therapists who have more of like that passion for it, have some sort of personal ties or experiences with it, or their personality matches with it versus ones that maybe thought like, oh, this would be interesting. Yeah. So you, there's just, I don't know if it's like more heart, there's something in there that just feels like there's a deeper connection and more of where you're supposed to be. absolutely absolutely and also just experiencing mental health struggles yourself makes you appreciate the field and appreciate those like us who are out here trying to help others yeah exactly well you mentioned grad school so tell me a little bit about that process even like undergrad what was your major so I, since I knew, since I was 10 years old, I went off to Clemson University for undergrad, um, got my degree in psychology with a minor in sociology. Nice. And so actually in undergrad, I had a professor tell me I'd never be able to be a therapist because I got one bad grade on a test of hers, which I ended up getting an A in her class and proving her wrong. Good. So she fueled my fire a little bit. <laughs> But I um, ended up graduating early um, and knowing that I wanted to go to grad school. So I had already applied like that process to me, looking back now seems so easy because it was just all boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. Um, But I know in the, in the moment it was stressful going to all the different interviews and things like that. And then having to make an ultimate decision of where am I going to take my future? Um, which is such a big decision Mm -hmm. um, to make. And I've always loved the city of Charlotte. Um, I'm from South Carolina. So Charlotte's been close by all along. And ultimately I felt like home in the city and I had family in the city. And so UNC Charlotte's program spoke to me. Mm. And when I had my interview with UNC Charlotte, I just knew that that was going to probably be where I was going to be. It felt like family. It felt like any professor that I had met was like rooting for me. It just felt really good and like the right decision, which is what ultimately led me to enroll in UNC Charlotte's uh, master's in clinical mental health program. 
Yeah. So why that program? Because I did UNC Charlotte's MSW program. So I'm curious why you went that route. So to be honest, I just, since I always knew I wanted to be a therapist, I just applied to the program that had mental health in it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The whole reason behind why I chose that program over the other. Mm-hmm. And also halfway through my grad school experience, I was like, oh, I could have gone other places and gotten a social work degree and been just fine. But I didn't know that in the process of applying. Yeah. Well, nobody tells you any of that, right? Or like a counseling degree or right. like, I mean, side or whatever. There's so many options. I know. Well, because UNC Charlotte called it a master's of clinical mental health mm. and NC State called it community mental health. Weird. Master's in community mental health. So I was like, I don't even <laughs> know what I'm applying to, but I <laughs> I hope it gets me where I need to be. Yeah, that sounds like me. I was like, I love Dawson's Creek and One Tree Hill. I want to go to North Carolina. What schools are there? (laughs) I'm like, that sounds cool. Charlotte's a bigger city. I'm going to have more fun there. Like, yeah, exactly. So (laughs) whatever. You kind of pick it. But it's like, you know, you're going to end up being a therapist anyway. You just kind of pick what life you're going to like the most too. Exactly. Which I think is such a tough decision to make at such a young age. Yes. I am really glad I trusted my younger self. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean obviously it's paying off. (laughs) So keep working that way. So now grad school, again, everybody's programs are so different. They're structured different. Um, I know some people I've spoken to, they've had like all their coursework the first year and the second year has been all internship. Mine was kind of split, like half the week was internship, half was classes. So what was your program structured like? So my program was really interesting because it was highly flexible. You could do your the program anywhere between like two years and six years. Oh, and wow. so a lot of people had their own choice in how fast they wanted to work through the program. Me coming straight from undergrad, not having any other jobs. I nannied on the side, but I was like, no, I can get through this as fast as humanly possible. So, mm-hmm. and also coming from 15 hours of classes a semester already, Four classes a week was basically this, this each semester I had. I'd have four classes a week my first semester. Then my mm-hmm. second semester, I had four classes a week and then 10 hours of practicum uh, um, where I worked um, with veterans that I decided to go take my practicum at CPCC in the veterans unit and work with veterans in, in school. And then the next year of programming was I would take four classes in the evenings and 20 hours of internship for that entire year and that's when I graduated okay nice so it was jam-packed <laughs> a jam-packed two years and yeah. so because the program is somewhat small it, even though you don't have a cohort you pretty much know after your first semester most of the people in your classes mm-hmm. and then it's just like meeting a couple of people who are in different places in their program in the program yeah, that's interesting. That's so different because I know like the social work one was sort of like you could do it in two years or three years. Mm-hmm. And some other people actually did it in like a year and a half. If they had a bachelor's in social work, they could just kind of jump into oh. like summer and then like my second year. And so, yeah, there was a lot of people in different stages, but for the most part, we had a cohort and that had its pros and cons, right? Like yeah. if there was people you really connected with, that was amazing. If there was ones that you really didn't, or there was just like very different focuses, then it yeah. felt like more separated. So, I mean, it, it might be nice because you were exposed to a lot of different people at different stages. Oh, yeah, it was wonderful. And even in my last semester, I took a diagnosis class that I didn't really need until the like that all I needed that for was the NCE. And so um, when I took that class, I was with all people starting the program for the first semester. Oh, interesting. So it was really great because I was in my second semester of internship working with borderline, bipolar, schizophrenia, like all of the acute mental illnesses. And I was able to help provide a lot of like personal experience within that class. And then like a a lot of those classmates were like, this is so fascinating. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in doing this as well. Um, Oh yeah. I want to be partnered with you on the projects and stuff. So I'd be like, she knows what she's doing. She's doing it right now. I'm just reading about it. Let me get with her. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. (laughs) And also, like, it still did feel like a cohort. Mm -hmm. I would the best part of the whole program was my group therapy class, where our group therapy Mm -hmm. professor had us do an experiential group as a class. So we got split up into two groups with an actual group therapist 
and there are, I think like 10 women in my group and I cannot thank the program enough for bringing me that group and those 10 women and a place to have free therapy, essentially. Seriously. Um, so I just always thought that that was such a cool part of the program. Yeah, that's amazing. And then you get that support because I'm sure you guys then got so much closer because now you really know each other, but you're get you get the client experience yes. as well. So it's like multifaceted benefits. Oh yeah. Cause like learning about group therapy as a group therapy participant is such a cool way to learn. Oh yeah. That's really good. Instead of just being thrown into it, yeah, like in exactly. an internship or something, you get that experience too. Right. Right. Was there anything that maybe wasn't as helpful in your program or something maybe looking back, you wish that they had? The one thing I would say is more education about private practice Mm -hmm. and what happens post-graduation. That, like, we spent a couple classes talking about some things. Mm -hmm. When you graduate, you are just thrown out into the wolves with licensure and with finding a supervisor and finding a job. And it is, I, that was a struggle for me. Yeah. And that brings me to my next question too, about kind of what did you do right after graduation and side note, almost every person I've spoken to has said that they wish that we'd had more of like a business component or something involved in under, I mean, in our graduate programs to help like, let us see what else is out there versus just the one path of like community mental health or a hospital or whatever else. Well, and I had always had the dream of having my own practice. So Mm -hmm. even like the mindset of like, Hey, this is what I'm going to do. And I would ask questions based off of that. I still didn't feel like I quite got the education I needed. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I totally agree with everyone else in that schools could add that component and an elective course, you know, to take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, you mentioned like after graduation is such a tough period. And I think it is for everybody, even those last few months of it, when you're panicked about, am I going to get a job? Who's going to hire me? You know, all that anxiety. So yeah, I thankfully was very young at the time. I graduated grad school when I was 24. So I had like a summer vacation (laughs) for my license. I traveled, I nannied, I like just hung out with friends I took full advantage of knowing that was likely going to be my last time for me Mm -hmm. um obviously it was really stressful in May getting everything together for licensure the fingerprints the like the application online was so complicated for North Carolina I I already knew the board was crappy (laughs) then I ran into issues with them receiving my test scores and Mm -hmm. that was I had to call them multiple times and so at at month three was when I officially got my license. So it did take me the full three months, Mm -hmm. but I had gotten a job working for a private practice, like two days before my license came in. Oh, wow. Good timing. I was applying. Yes. And we were all like in any of the interviews I went on, it was all contingent on when my license was to come through. So you graduated and then took like your clinical exam. And then you could get your license or no? Sorry, UNC Charlotte's clinical mental health program, you take all of your exams in the program. Oh, interesting. You have everything taken care of when you graduate. All you have to do is submit everything to the board for licensure. And then you get your associate's licensure Mm -hmm. um, where you have to get those 3,000 hours and supervision and all that. And so- everything was all taken care of for me. That's nice. Cause social work, they really were like, they had somebody from the board come talk to us in one class and be like, if you want to go this route, here's the application, here's the address to send it. And then we could take our exam anytime in those two years after, like we got our associate license Mm -hmm. and, but it had to be within that two years. And if you didn't pass it within that two years, all of your hours restarted stressful yeah. so, and I've known a few people who ended up just leaving the field because maybe they failed it by like two questions wait yeah. a few months you take it again and so I love that your program it sounds like they prepared you a lot more for that yes. well and something I will say I'm very thankful for 
um, is that on the last few days, our last few classes, we filled out the information that we had to send off to the board in the class with our professor telling us what we need to write. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, if you're going to do uppercase, you have to stick with uppercase. They won't (laughs) accept it. And so he was really great about knowing the little details Uh of application, but still, even with that help, there was still so much more that I was like, I I don't know. Do I call for transcripts? Do they send my transcript? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And then like you said, how long the board can take to get back to you, the money that it costs to submit the applications and sometimes have to pay for the transcripts and all of that. It's a lot in that period. (laughs) Yes, it is. It is. And then it's like, okay, well now you just have to wait basically three months and then you can start working. Right. So like you said, at least you found something to do to make that time worth it. But (laughs) wow. So then your first job after school was private practice. It was. So it actually happened to be what I thought was going to be a really special opportunity. I've been wanting to work in private practice. I saw this job application and I have been applying for so many jobs and only hearing back every so often. And so when I heard back, she was very interested in an interview and, and I heard back from her setting up the interview on the day of my uncle's funeral. And so I was like, this is a sign. Mm -hmm. This is a sign of where I need to go. Mm -hmm. And so I, from the get-go, before I even went and interviewed, felt a connection to this practice, which I think influenced a lot of my um, behavior and loyalty to the practice. Mm -hmm. Um, So I went and interviewed. And that was interesting because they had me do a personality test, which I had never done that for a job before. (laughs) Um, Turns out she had me do that just to see if my personality would fit with the others in the office. Okay. It was an interesting move, but Mm -hmm. all the other therapists in the practice were a part of the interview. It was all young women, 30 and under, and um, two of them had gone to UNC Charlotte, same program. Um, and they all seem super sweet. They guaranteed me 20 to 25 clients a week. And, um, I felt really good about it from that interview. And they told me when I walked in, you have the job. We just want to tell you about it Mm. to make sure it's going to be a good fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about, um, cause I know it can be kind of controversial for therapists. They have like very strong opinions. Some of them about like, you can't go to private practice after you graduate, you have to pay your dues. And other people are like, why burn myself out in one area when I know I'm going to end up in the private practice arena anyway. So I don't know if you came up against any of that, or if you could just speak on like your experiences being a new clinician in private practice. So because I had just done an, a year long internship in acute care Mm -hmm. I felt that I had done some service giving also a year and a half of free labor to two different establishments I was like I have put in my work it is time to start getting paid Mm -hmm. so for me jumping into the private practice was thrilling like I said it's what I always wanted to do and to kind of mediate there I, I would take on pro bono clients and I would try to make sure I was serving someone who needed the extra help but maybe couldn't afford it or was oppressed in some way shape or form um and so I felt very comfortable slipping right into the role of private practice however I was shocked when they said I'd get 20 to 25 clients a week and started out with two clients for three weeks straight Yeah. See, that's like the only real downside I see when it comes to private practice is just like, if you're in community mental health or something like that, you're burned out, but you're getting like all 40 hours a week or whatever, because they're burning you out private practice. You're not burned out, but it's going to take you a little bit longer to get the hours. But I think it's, yeah, it's tough then because I think sometimes, and I know from personal experience, (laughs) um, you get sold on like what a group practice is going to be. And then, uh, yeah, or any job, honestly, but then it's not always that way. So, right. Cause I think I would have been shocked in community mental health as well. I think had I gone to an agency and they were like, yeah, you're going to see about seven clients a day and you're going to get about $30 per client. I think 
I would throw up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I almost did <laughs> a couple of times yeah. in my two years. Yeah. Um, because that to me already recognizing my limitations, mm-hmm. like that to me sounded too intensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like you said, and this is, I guess, speaking on that, you know, controversial, whatever, is that you'd had the experience with multiple types of diagnoses with people, with veterans, and like you said, certain settings where there was multiple services there yes. and you had the experience and that helped you decide more of like what your, if not niche, like more of what the area or the setting is that you knew served you best, not what is expected amongst right. this field, which is a great thing that you already knew that early. Well, and I'm so thankful for it because it could have been such a disservice to clients had I been in a a place that would not have been good for my own mental health, because Mm -hmm. we know as therapists, if we're not doing well, we can't serve our clients as well. Um, So there's so much importance in taking care of yourself and being able to have that space and the time to take care of yourself because the work that we do is therapist is incredibly difficult at times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're right too. Cause a lot of those places tend to have higher turnover. So because people are burned out, but then that means that a client may have three different therapists in a year. Right. So yeah. at least in the setting you were in with private practice, then it's like at that point, you know, there'd be some consistency. So. Right. And then a year, I mean, not a year into it, six, six months into it. I was like, I miss working I'm like residential partial. So I did end up adding on a PRN position back at Hope mm-hmm. where I interned to get, I love group therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that's controversial, <laughs> but I loved group therapy. So it was nice to be able to fulfill that need a bit and also work back in the community on top of private practice in an as needed position. Great. And then that helps supplement your hours, right? So then you were able to, I mean, income too, but you were able to like gain more hours. And BW2 employee instead of a contractor employee. Mm, That's another thing. Yeah. Then nobody's touched on that yet. So can you speak, if you don't mind a little bit on the differences between the two? Yes. So this is something that also was very shocking to me as a new therapist. So being an independent contractor, which is what you might be in a lot of private or group practices, um, is called a 1099. You are contracted with that business and there's a contract that you have to sign and you get taxed higher and you aren't getting taxed throughout the year unless you have an accountant or a business license that license that helps you do so. And so what you're bringing in is what you're keeping. Um, And then come tax time, when you file your taxes, you end up having to pay such a large sum because you have not been paying taxes throughout the year. Whereas a W-2, from my understanding, is taking out throughout the year of what needs to be taken out for taxes. So Mm -hmm. when you file that during tax season, you may still owe some money, but you also, it might also help um, pay off some of what you owe as an independent contractor. Correct. Yeah. And I think sometimes with W-2 employee, if you're in a W-2 employee, your employer pays half your taxes typically too. So that's why it feels like you get a lot. Go ahead. Yeah. And you get benefits Uh, Mm -hmm. or some people get benefits, health insurance, um, PTO, vacation days, things like that. Right. Independent contractor, if you're not working, you're not making money. If you are, are over the age of 26, you have to get your own health insurance plan and that can be very expensive, but their tax deductions, which is what you do as an independent contractor is the things that you have to pay for your business, like rent and health insurance, um, car payments, things like that, that can be deducted from your taxes. Yeah. Which is something that was never talked about in school. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And you also have to make sure the right person is telling you what to deduct, because if you listen to someone who might not know what they're talking about, you could get yourself into some legal trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And everyone's terrified of the IRS. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So yeah, definitely get like the right people behind you helping with all that. So, yeah. So for you then being a 1099, like, and then having the caseload build slower, it was like the right setting, but maybe not necessarily at that point, like feasible for you, whether it was income wise, or even just like some of the challenges or the faster pace stuff that you missed. So yeah. So how did that progress? Like as you worked towards your hours and over time? 
So the reason why I only had two clients for the first three weeks is because my practice owner and one of the other therapists in the practice both left for two week vacations to Europe a week after I started. So I was, I had the two people that were already set up for me. And then I wasn't really as much in control about who else was coming in. There was only one other therapist in the office. And so for me, it was show up for my two clients and then go home because there's nothing else I can do at this point. Mm. Once they came back, I was able to finally tack on some more clients and slowly started building until October when I started to kind of have a more comfortable foundation okay. of clients. Um, but I also still nannied throughout working the whole time um, for that first like four months because I had so much extra free time. So mm -hmm. if I, if, if anyone is wanting to go right into private practice, can't guarantee you clients right off the bat, then it would be very important to have a passive income or some other job on the side lined up in order to afford to live. Yeah. And again, something else that was not covered in school, because I know plenty of people that worked at their job, even if they were working full-time in community mental health, like the pay was so low for some people that it wasn't enough, depending on like where they were at in life, if they, right. their rent was expensive, they had kids, whatever the situation was that they found themselves like working at grocery stores, working at, you know, restaurants, like still doing some of the jobs they did in undergrad, but with a master's just because the pay can be low in the beginning. Exactly, exactly. And that is just pretty heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, and again, why I appreciated being in private practice, because I only had to show up for those two clients I was seeing. Yeah. And so I did have so much more free time to be like, yeah, I can nanny eight hours for you tomorrow. I don't have anything else to do. Mm -hmm. so I was actually making more money from nannying. <laughs> first four months than uh, anything else. But um, once I hit January of 2020, so that was um, coming off of Christmas, my caseload eventually came to a really good foundation. Yeah. So just setting that realistic expectation for yourself that if you're starting out in private practice, you know, it takes in, in any setting, whether it's licensed or pre-licensed, not licensed, whatever it's going to be, that it takes that, that bit to build up. So just setting that expectation. Right. Exactly. And understanding what you might be getting into beforehand, despite mm -hmm. me maybe not being taught this in grad school. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you might have to take some of those jobs or side hustles for the time being until your other stuff builds up, but right. which is why everyone should be so thankful for this channel so that they can <laughs> learn about these things. Yeah. Prepare themselves. Cause we didn't know guys. We didn't know. No, we didn't have this when we were graduating. No, we just lived it. And now we're trying to pay it forward. So you guys don't have to live it, but, um, well, tell me a little bit more about, uh, I guess your experiences with private practice. So like were you able to set your own hours? How were you feeling about like the clients you were getting? Did you have some say over that I had pretty much full autonomy nice. um so that was amazing I was allowed to set my hours I was allowed to set my private pay if someone did not have insurance so I could pick and choose whatever rate I wanted I was able no I was not able to change the no-show fee uh but I was also able to do my own paperwork um with the letterhead and everything over mm -hmm. it and as long as it was approved but I had a lot of autonomy in my practice which I think helped and hurt at the same time um but also think that building a caseload requires time mm -hmm. and um eventually it was I was able to have my name be spread out to other people and then starting getting clients word of mouth, but I am very thankful that because I was a part of a group practice, that name brought clients in. And then, um, when I eventually left the practice, I was able to take all of those clients with me, which was so fantastic that I didn't have to start over. Um, yeah. but yeah, my experience in private practice started out pretty great, but I also unfortunately had a very risky practice owner. 
Yeah. And that's tough because you're at the discretion of them ultimately. So it's like, even if there's certain pieces of your work with clients and things that you have control over, you're still under that umbrella of somebody else. And they're ultimately the decision maker. Exactly. So I was very confused after two, three months of working when I would hear from the practice owner and be like, you need to be in the office more, even if you're not having sessions, because we need to have a better community in the office. Mm -hmm. And I was very confused by that aspect of it. And so that's where I did start to notice some of like the, how practices could be different. Like I felt like this was just a requirement of this specific practice owner mm -hmm. um, and that she, um, it almost felt like she was just trying to be friends with everyone. So it just, it felt uncomfortable. And that's, I think where fear can be in private practice is like, what are the boundaries mm -hmm. and how am I supposed to know those as someone who maybe is young or starting out or doesn't really understand the world quite yet and how it works. Mm -hmm. I think that was, that was a really tough pill to swallow in my experience. And paying attention to your instincts. Cause even if you didn't know those things on like a rational level, like mm -hmm. something in you emotionally and physically was like, mm, this doesn't feel right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So definitely some challenges, but I am very thankful for that practice to allow me to build my foundation and to grow. Yeah. So tell us about your practice then. So you went from the group practice to then starting your own. Yes. So do you mind if I share a little bit about my experience of why I had yes. to like practice and go into my private practice? Let us know the red flags. <laughs> Let us know the Great. things that we you know we should be looking at. Yes, mm -hmm. please do. So starting with the practice owner requiring clinicians to stay mm -hmm. at the office, which to me was 30 minutes away from my home, mm. just because she wanted to hang out. And it wasn't, at first it was like, okay, we're consulting cases. I see the benefits of this. But then it very quickly turned into triangulation and gossiping and a lot of sticky dynamics. There was a lot of manipulation going on mm. um, that I was unaware of because I was just so young and so ignorant into the working world that I was like, if, if a practice owner is saying this is how it has to be, then it has to be that way. Right. I was told that, um, I was told that I was not allowed to touch anything with billing right off the bat. And so I thought that was a little uncomfortable because that was something I wanted to learn as I wanted to be my own practice owner one day. Mm -hmm. And I was also not allowed to contract with any other insurances. And um, there were a few other rules that she had in place that were just strict and a little uncomfortable, but nothing worth concern until the pandemic started. And when the pandemic started, was when the boundaries really started to fall. Mm. She required all of our locations. She would not pay a clinician if the, if the clinician's location on find my friends on your iPhone. So nothing even business related. Your personal phone. Yes, personal phone, find my friends. If your location was not turned on and in Charlotte or Huntersville, then you were not getting paid, which is illegal. Yeah. Um, so that was the first terrifying thing mm -hmm. being told we could not travel, being told we could not go anywhere. We couldn't see our families. We couldn't do telehealth. We couldn't do assessments via telehealth. And then all of a sudden we could do assessments via telehealth. And then the triangulation started getting really, really bad. It would be, oh, this person voted for Trump in 2016. So we need to boycott this clinician. Mm. Like really immature thinking. And at this point, I felt very desperate, but also so new to the field that I felt like I couldn't escape. Right. And, and there's so, a power dynamic there because of, in like multiple aspects between being younger, being new, this is your first like real job outside of school. Like, you know, or this is the place you're trying to build a career and learn all of these things to have your dream job. And you're being like, it feels like high school <laughs> actually. Right. right. So two of the clinicians did leave. They wow. left. And so once that happened, 
happened? Well, all the location sharing stopped. Mm -hmm. And then it got quiet and it got better for a while until the triangulation came back. Because now it was me, one clinician, and the practice owner. And I was angelicized and my uh, the other clinician, my good friend, was demonized. And it was blatantly obvious. She mm -hmm. had four clients on her caseload. I had 18 clients on my caseload at the time. It was not fair and it was not appropriate. To the what and it all started breaking down when our supervisor realized she had never gotten us MPI numbers. And this is where the struggle with grad school really comes in. Mm -hmm. In grad school, I remember them talking about an MPI number, but no one ever said, this is what you need. This is what you have to do. This is just part of being a therapist is an MPI number. Mm -hmm. I thought you just automatically get one when you get licensed. So when we confronted, our supervisor was like, you don't have MPI numbers. That's not okay. Your so outside we, supervisor. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Who did not work for the practice. Mm -hmm. When she got whiff of that, she was like, you need to confront your practice owner. My practice owner forged documents that made it seem like I had an MPI number and a CAQH profile. She factored those docs. I mean, she altered Doctor, those documents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And, um, and then she just kept getting more and more rogue with her responses to things till one day she just randomly said, we, someone came up to our house this past weekend and knocked on our door and said, I want to buy your house. So I'm moving to Raleigh in a month. And so the other therapist and I were like, Oh, mean for us. And we're not even allowed to do virtual assessments. So what does this mean for our practice? Right. You're moving a few hours away from where we're located. So like what's happening here and in a month. So then, then that's when she decided, okay, we're going to do virtual assessments from now on. Cause I've decided it's okay now. It's all right. I've like right. blessed it. Not that it was okay the entire um, time. Right. But I will not use simple practice because I think that's too expensive, but I won't give you any other tools to do telehealth. And, um, so then she was like, okay, you guys can find an office and practice out of there. And I will give you 90% of what to pay for the office. And I'll keep that 10% for doing your billing. We're like, this sounds great. This sounds mm -hmm. fun. We're out of our lives. We get our autonomy. We have the group practice name. We're yeah. good. Until she decides to come up with a new contract that does not say that. She tried to manipulate us into signing a contract contract that would not have allowed her to pay us what we needed to afford an office and had been moving to Raleigh. So on that day, we decided we are resigning. And that's when she started withholding pay. And on that day was when I opened my practice. Ooh, there's a lot there. <laughs> She would log us out of our stuff and went restricted our access to clients. So thankfully, as we knew she was escalating, mm -hmm. we were gathering verbal and written um, documents, allowing our clients to follow us. Lots and lots and lots of red flags and problems with that whole situation. So I'm like, oh God, where to start? Um, so one thing is, again, going back to like following your instincts, there was a lot of stuff that you were like, this is not working. You also were able to coordinate with some other people to kind of see if there's like, felt like validating your experiences and seeing, is this a shared experience? Because sometimes you need to know, like, am I the only one seeing this? <laughs> Especially when you're first starting out, because it feels crazy. Um the yes. other part of that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just about to say to that is that when the other therapist left over mm -hmm. the summer, they then let us know some of the previous behaviors and actions that the practice owner had been doing over the years that indicated exactly what I had been thinking and that she was hiring new clinicians because she could take advantage of them mm -hmm. and firing for no reason. <sighs> yeah. And that then again, validates like, okay, this is not just me or this one person. It's literally everybody here, which then is the, what's the common denominator. It's the owner. So, um, another point you hit on, I think that was, that's really worth diving into a little bit is the MPI number and CAQH. 
never heard those words at all until my first job. Wow. Yeah, not at all. I QH until um, a year into my first job. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I started community mental health and I, as they were setting me up in their system, I got a piece of paper that was like, hey, I created a login and I created a password for you. And here's your number. Thank God they gave it to me, but like I wasn't a part of that process. They like pretended to be me because they had my entire hiring packet with my social security, like all of the things that you would need. So luckily it was like a very ethical, nice person, but I also had no idea what an MPI number was. So for the baby therapists out here, like it's a national provider identification number that any type of provider in medical, anything has to have. Yeah, and it follows you. Providers. Yes. Mm-hmm. And don't put your personal information out there on your MPI number. Cause it is public record. Public. <laughs> exactly. So you're going to have it registered to whatever place you're at first. So that way people can't just Google you. Um, but you want to make sure that you have, you yourself have the login information because because that became a problem for me as I switched jobs was like, well, they created this password and stuff and they gave me the email, but I don't even have that access to email because it was my work email. So yeah, that's a big piece. And then CAQH is for um, insurances, right? So you put like all your information in a database and then these insurance companies can pull where you work, your MPI numbers, license numbers, all of that. So if you guys didn't have those, you were working without the proper identification to even be able to bill some of these things or whatever else. So this fraud somewhere in there that was happening. Multiple types of fraud. That was just one of the <sighs> committed insurance fraud as well, which is a part of the MPI and CAQH, which is billing everyone under herself for certain insurances mm-hmm. rather than us having our own individual profiles within the group. Because with an MPI and a CAQH, you like you said it can be within the group all she had to do was help us create that Mm -hmm. but what would have changed is that I would not have been accepting Blue Cross Blue Shield Cigna Aetna clients within weeks of getting my license Mm -hmm. wow I didn't know that moment because Mm -hmm. how would you know Exactly. Again, that's all stuff that's not covered. So you're expecting that you're going to go to this place, especially because the way you were sold on it was that it was amazing. There's all these people, everybody's younger, everyone's in a similar stage of their career. Everyone's going to encourage each other. You're going to get all these hours. And then it wasn't that way at all. And I think a lot of people have similar experiences, especially in group practices. So I can imagine that because it's so complicated. Mm -hmm. And because as a new clinician, you just don't know what you could be missing. Exactly. You don't know what to look for. And the people that are going to prey on, you are going to look for the people who don't know what what the red flags are to look for what questions to ask. So when she said, I like hiring new grads from UNC Charlotte, was she saying that because she likes the, because she knows that we are not receiving education about MPIs or CAQH numbers. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're easier targets. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that thought still messes with me today because Mm -hmm. it's just thinking about it is very complicated and complex of how much I was taken advantage of as a new clinician. Right. And if you hadn't had that outside supervisor, which I think is another really good point that I want to like hear a little bit more about, because I've known people in a similar situation who were getting too, their group owner was wearing too many hats. Or the place they were working at was wearing too many hats and it burns them because there's so much boundary crossing everywhere. The person who pays you probably should be the same one who's like grading you as far as your license goes. There's too many things. So tell me a little bit about like that relationship, like paying for supervision and what that helped you with. So I actually will share a little funny side note before I get into that. One of the clinicians at the practice had... Their original supervisor was actually a professor from my program. Oh, wow. I never knew why they stopped working together, but then she ended up working with Angela, who, and Angela, if you're watching this, I love you so much. You (laughs) were the best thing that ever happened to me. (laughs) Because the clinician had Angela as her supervisor, I ended up adopting Angela when I came on too. But what turns out is the reason why the old supervisor, I was so shocked because I loved that professor. He was so ethical. He taught my ethics class. Mm -hmm. He was catching on to something. That's why he was fired. Ah, 
the practice owner made the other therapist say, I can't see you anymore. I have to find a new therapist because what you're telling me isn't correct. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Found that out after the fact. But anyways, it led us into the hands of Angela. And so having an outside supervisor, thankfully I got really lucky in the fact that there was another associate clinician within the practice who already had Angela as a supervisor. So she asked Angela for me, like, hey, would you mind taking on a new supervisee? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then we could do group supervision too. So that's how it all started. Angela came and we had like a little interview um, right off the bat and we agreed that we would be a good fit together and that I was really looking forward to working with her. And so right off the bat, I started working with Angela and she's super ethical. She has her own um, business, Southern Family Medicine, like working in addiction. So she and had been in the field for forever. So she had a lot of great insight and was extremely resourceful throughout my whole prep. I mean, my whole time in supervision. That's awesome. Um, and she was the one who was able to start picking up on things when things went wrong. It wasn't until, so another clinician who came on after me also adopted Angela. And so we would have group supervision, the three of us, and that's when we found out about the NPI numbers, mm, yeah. that is where it all happened was through supervision. So that's why, I mean, one, I think supervision is amazing as a new therapist because Definitely. it is your sounding board. It is your person who helps you understand your cases and analyzing your clients and getting you from A to B. And so having a great supervisor is so important. Mm -hmm. And also in my case scenario, she was able to eventually point out what was wrong. She was able to tell me what was wrong, but not illegal. Mm -hmm. She was able to tell me what was wrong and illegal. Mm -hmm. And the day, the last day I ever worked for Lake Norman counselors, I had session, a virtual session And she logged me out of my stuff so that I could not reach my client. And so, and and my colleague as well. And so in that moment, Angela paneled, or she had already paneled the both of us. She had preemptively paneled us. And so we were already approved under her and could be our our clients. We got contracted with Cigna and Aetna, thanks to the pandemic, um, under her. (laughs) And so literally could keep, Every single client of ours, wow. every single client of ours all came with us. We both opened our own individual practices with offices right next door to each other. Uh-huh. Um, but that that was like a month later because we had to start only telehealth in, mm-hmm. in that moment because it was that day we switched <laughs> over, we signed up for simple practice, created our, our names, like all of this a whole Google admin situation. But I'm so lucky and thankful that I was living with that therapist at the time that we got to do the whole process together. Yeah. That's scary with our supervisor. Yeah. So building that team of your own support, like that's really what helps get you through. And I think you made a really good point about having somebody that's a supervisor on the outside who can provide that outside perspective, but who also has the experience to be able to tell you things or have you look for things or ask certain questions that you wouldn't even know about otherwise. Exactly. Like I said, a wonderful sounding board for so many things. And I would say, what did I, she, she only paid, charged me $60 for supervision. So for me, the cost was not too expensive. Mm-hmm. God, and it ended up being completely worth it. So <laughs> again, that's how <laughs> best money I've ever spent. <laughs> and also her husband happens to be a billing specialist. So they took us on this <laughs> That's our billing specialist. Perfect. But see, that's a case where there's clear boundaries, right? This is your role. This is your role. And she was like, do your own thing. Like, I will help support you do your own thing. I will just be what you need me to be in this position to get you doing your own thing. She absolutely was. And she absolutely was. I also thought it was a really cool experience in the supervisory process that while I was in the middle of that, I got to start my own practice and got to receive supervision in regards to starting a practice, which I think is a, a probably a pretty rare experience because not a lot of people do start their pri- 
own private practice within a year of graduation. <laughs> True. Yeah. And other people later on have to pay for like a business coach or do a, a course or program or spend all of this time researching it. And you had somebody right there that you were already meeting with to be able to kind of like pick their brain and help you through this process. Right. Because to me, since it was not talked about in grad school, mm -hmm. I was like opening a private practice requires a business license, business plan, this, that, and the other. And in a moment of crisis, it required none of that. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> all you need is your last name. That's all you need. True. Yeah. And, and an MPI number and a CAQH profile. Is <laughs> you know? Yeah. But it's like, once you know that stuff, then you're like, okay, I'm good to go. And then you have the support of somebody being like, let me help you get all like those ins and outs of it because you already know how to do the therapy side of things. Yeah. You need the clients, which, and that's its own thing with like her being petty, you know, like the owner being petty and taking it on you guys, not even considering what that would do for the clients. Oh, it was awful. She emailed our clients behind our back, trying to say we were slandering her, which we never had. We never mentioned one thing about the practice owner. We just said, the practice no longer aligns with our goals as a therapist. It was going fully virtual and I want to be in person. That's all we told our clients. Mm -hmm. And so for her to send an email like that to our clients, for many of them, thankfully it confirmed why we were leaving the practice. For a lot of them, they were like, Victoria, did something happen? Like, <laughs> what's going on? like, what's the tea? What's the drama? Like, <laughs> That'd be me as a client. <laughs> like, I need to know. And I'm like, I just, I just wanted an office in person and kind of wanted to do my own thing. And so like, they were very confused. Mm -hmm. And then some of my clients had relation, like relationships with some of her clients and then would tell me some things. And so oh, God. it just, I just, it was confirmed that I was doing absolutely the best thing possible right um, through that experience and my clients were very grateful to walk away from that practice as well because she was not nice to clients she mm. sent the snarkiest emails to clients um and that's that did not align with me and I knew when I opened my own practice eventually I was going to have a different approach yeah and that's something else that I think is good to touch on is where you're working directly reflects on you. So if you're figuring out like the values or lack of values that are going on over here, the practices that are happening, like if that's not for you, you're now associated with that. So it's like, you have to protect your reputation, especially coming up new, like you've got to protect your reputation and also yourself. Like this wasn't aligning with you professionally or personally. No. And I will say three of my clients, she overcharged them for their therapy session she didn't feel um, correctly and so she had clients overpaying by like 70 80 dollars per session for their sessions when they when I switched over and went with a billing specialist their copays were ten dollars so I had three clients who lost a lot of money because of her that's so bad and so they were deeply upset. And of course I was working with them through that of like, mm -hmm. I, I understand like, this is an awful situation where you've been taken advantage of while at, this, at the same time, I, I was in that as boat as well. She right. wasn't paying anymore. She's well, the moment we resigned, she stopped paying. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what sessions were pending that you were supposed to be paid for or what else it was just done. Yeah. The other clinician was owed like probably upwards of 3000 something dollars. Thankfully mine was under 600 um, because we had been pretty settled up and I take time off for Christmas. So like, I didn't have a lot of sessions on the books, thankfully. Yeah. Um, but she ended up having to pay taxes and getting a, a 1099 from the practice owner a year later after going through all of this. Because eventually after threatening her with lawyers and a cease and desist, we were able to get paid. Jeez. It was accurate payment that we were owed though. But like, why all the headache? Like that's so many things that you're like, well, I didn't think I'd have to learn any of this stuff, but here we go. Like now you're learning about legal stuff. And it's interesting too, that you'd asked in the beginning about the billing and you weren't privy to any of that. Now it makes sense. Why? Well, and the, the biggest thing that makes me laugh and that just puts a smile on my face throughout this whole thing is that her, the practice owner's biggest thing to tell us and to teach us is CYA, cover your ass, mm -hmm. which 
as a therapist, yes, you have to CYA. Absolutely. Especially as a therapist who owns their own business, you have mm-hmm. to cover your ass legally. But she forgot to remake our contracts. Um, so we were not contractually obligated to her. So she did not CYA, which is why we were able to not be bulldozed in the end and receive our payments is because we actually covered our ass. We took that lesson. <laughs> we used it. Oh, karma. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, that's great though. Cause you guys deserve to be paid. It was the work that you did. And yeah. geez, it's just unfortunate that so much of your group practice experience was what not to do as a business owner versus what to do. Sure. Absolutely. Um, and also at the same time, like I, I do really miss that aspect of hanging out with other clinicians all the mm-hmm. time, just having a common space where we're walking into someone's office. I still do have that at my practice now, but it, with it being a group practice, I don't know, there was just more of a community. I think. Yeah. That's something that I miss too. I had made really good friends at the one I was at. So to be able to be like, Oh, you have a no show. I have a no show. <laughs> or like I have a cancellation. Let's yeah. hang out and like, or have a session and be like, whoo, that was a doozy. Like I need to talk about it for a second and process it. Erin, the therapist who has the office next to me, I walked into the office yesterday and I, I her, our calendars, I can see when she's busy and not busy. Yeah. So when she was in back-to-back sessions, I see her door crack and I come in and I'm like, yes, you have to show we can see. <laughs> yes. like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so awesome though. Cause we need that sense of community. So is there any like advice you would have for clinicians in that period of time, like who maybe have left a group practice or doing a solo one about like creating community? Cause like, what have you done to create that? So you have an office next to a friend, huge. Yes. Yes. Huge. But thankfully the office, so the office space that we ended up at, we went and viewed because one of the previous clinicians who left the practice that we really loved, the play therapist had her office there. So we were like, let's go check it out. Mm -hmm. And so we knew with her there, we could have that community again. Mm -hmm. And then it turned out that pretty much everyone else in the building who was either already there or came after, um, they were um also either therapists or estheticians or massage therapists so a lot of people that kind of are you know big in the helping people profession and so it is a lot of pushing yourself to walk out of your office when you have a no show or a break and seeing whose doors are open or Mm -hmm. seeing someone's in the break room I think having a break room is also a really big thing like Mm -hmm. if you're opening up a practice Maybe do it in a communal building um, where you know there's going to be a break room or community space where you can get together with one another. And and also at the same time, um, you can, and I know a therapist is currently doing this in my office, is renting out your office. Mm -hmm. And so I rent my office out on Thursdays and Fridays. And so that brings a whole nother therapist into the mix. And even though I'm not socializing with that therapist, I know that that therapist has the ability to connect and make a community with the people in my office who I know are amazing. And she's just starting out her practice. So she's only Mm -hmm. working with her own practice two days a week. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think there are a lot of ways that you can kind of like hack your way into a good scenario. Um, And one of those could be renting, sharing an office with someone, or it could be just going to um, an office building where a lot of other therapists have offices um, sticking close by to therapists. And if not that, then joining Facebook groups, going to networking events, things like that in order to continue to create and grow your community and your network. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's how we met was a group (laughs) for therapists. So, I mean, it worked out for us. (laughs) So, but yeah, I think that that's great because I, that's something that I think is like the number one complaint for people who are going into private practice is like, it's kind of lonely. So that's kind of the only one I've really heard is that people saying like, yeah, it's sort of lonely. I love being able to do all these things on my own and have the control and, you know, pursue my passion, but that's the piece of it. So creating that community for sure. Absolutely. Um, exactly. Can you tell us a little bit about your practice now? Like what that looks like, who you're seeing? Sure. So I work with clients ages like 14 years old and up. Um, there's no cap on the age either. Mm -hmm. So, um, all adults of any age, 
Um, I work best with anxiety. Anxiety is my, my groove. That's something that I, I know very well. I understand the emotional regulation that needs to take place in terms of anxiety, but I also work heavily with depression, um, self-esteem issues, um, uh, relationship issues, transitions in life, just, you know, a very like general private practice do work heavily with the LGBTQ community mm -hmm. um, and do work with a lot of transgender clients. So that's awesome. a population I really love working with. Um, but, and also women is a great population to work with, but I also love my men too. So yeah. like, honestly, I just love most all clients, except for, I cannot work with eating disorders, unfortunately. Uh -huh. That's just something that you need so much education in and True. I don't have that education. Um, and trauma it's, can be hit or miss for me as well. Like I, um, I feel comfortable with referring out to EMDR, yeah. um, but also working with, you know, other problems on top of a client going to EMDR. I'm like, like I said, I'm located up in Huntersville off of exit 25, like right behind the target. So it's really fun. I tell my clients, yeah, after therapy, you can either go to target and treat yourself, or you can go to Chick-fil-A and get a milkshake either way. Cause target's right there. Oh. And Chick-fil-A is right there. My office is right here. Oh my God. I would just be circling. I'm getting some stuff at target, hit up Chick-fil-A on the way home. <laughs> crumble cookie before you go home because oh. that's also right there by my office okay. and a mark from home good. So it's like, what? <laughs> yes. I could take like a field trip out there and just be there. Whole day. Some of my clients who travel up from Charlotte are like, the target up there is the best. So I come oh. like 30 minutes early. And I just <laughs> the aisles. I'm like, I'm so glad that you make a trip out of this. So <laughs> smart. So yeah, I'm located out there. I work typically hours from like 11 to 6, mm -hmm. um, 6.30. I accept people in person via telehealth. Um, I currently do have a full caseload. So nice. I'm not seeing new clients at this moment, but I know come May, I mm -hmm. will definitely have some availability. Yeah, it's the summer. <laughs> Everybody's uh -huh. out doing stuff, feeling better. Yeah, everyone, yeah everyone's happy. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, you mentioned EMDR earlier, like referring people out for that. Was there any trainings, any courses, any books, podcasts, any resources that you've had that have helped you in your career? Um, there's a lot. So uh, working for Hopeway, they have packets on healthy relationships, DVD, mm -hmm. DVD self-awareness. It's all stuff I used when I did group therapy for them. And so I bring a lot of that material. I'm a very active counselor. So like, I like doing worksheets or talking about skills. Mm -hmm. um, and so I bring out a lot of those worksheets from, um, from my time there because I saw them work over and over and over again with acute, mm -hmm. with acute care. So that is probably my number one resource that I use. I did acceptance and commitment training, which I liked. But I'm just such a CBT therapist <laughs> that like that is my main go to. But I do want to do um, some more trauma informed trainings. I did trauma focused CBT, but mm -hmm. I don't work with children. And I know that mm -hmm. TFCBT is really children oriented. True. So I'm kind of looking for ways to expand. But then I'm also on top of everything. Um, trying to do some side projects as well and expand outside of the clinical based um, part of me. So um, just kind of exploring all that's out there for us therapists, because there's so much to help sure. us grow and to help us learn. Yeah. And then that's great because like you said, if you're at a certain point in your career where you're like, my practice is stable and you know, things are finally the way you want to need them to be in your career, you can start reaching out and doing some other things and mixing it up, which will be fun too and challenging. Exactly. Exactly. That's the part I'm trying to figure out right now. <laughs> but you're absolutely right in that. Like once I reach that level of stability, mm -hmm. which I would say for all you new therapists, for me personally, with everything I've been through, it took me 
started in August of 2019. I'd probably say August, well, maybe more so January of 2021, February of 2021 was when my practice finally started stabling out. And I finally, for the first time, really had full caseloads. Obviously that shifts and that changes as a therapist. True. But um, that was, it really kind of took that time for me to finally have the foundation to be like stable in that of at least 20 clients a week. Yeah, which is a great number too. And my ideal number. (laughs) Definitely, yeah. So, and that's true. Like once it's kind of like with clients, right? Like once your needs are met, you can start thriving. Like you're done surviving. Like you can start thriving. And that's how it was for you. Like you survived that terrible experience and you ended up thriving in the end. So exactly. That is something like if you go through anything challenging or you go through anything in this field that really makes you question things, it helps you grow. Mm Mm-hmm. We're great at self-awareness. That was most of what my grad school was. <laughs> so we're to build self-awareness. And so when you can utilize that self-awareness and help plan and make your situation better for yourself, I just think that this field has a wealth of opportunities. They're not taught to us all the time. Mm-hmm. It takes some exploring and some digging to figure that out. But once you do, it can be so beneficial for you. Exactly. And then you can get what you want out of this field. It's just a matter of either finding it or sometimes like you did, you have to create it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Well, my last question is what do you wish that you knew earlier in your career? Mm. To be patient, honestly. Yeah. I think that is something like I spent so much time stressing about building my caseload or about having my caseload drop or rise like in private practice that happens. It changes, it shifts. I wish that I had known going into it, like, Hey, your summers, enjoy yourself. 